Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my talk today is going to be based on a talk by Shunryu Suzuki. And um, it's from this book, Not Always So, which is a collection of his talks. And I think most of you know who he is, but just to be sure, um, Shunryu Suzuki has a deep connection to Minnesota Zen Meditation Center. He um, was Tim Burkett's first teacher. Um, Tim was our guiding teacher and is still one of our senior teachers. And um, Suzuki Roshi's assistant was Dainin Kedigiri Roshi, who um, was invited to come to Minnesota by some Minnesota Zen students in the 70s to form um, Minnesota Zen Meditation Center. So um, Suzuki Roshi is really deeply connected. It's part of our lineage and um, in some way is responsible for the uh, development of our school of Zen, which is the Minnesota Zen School. So um, the talk that I want to talk about is called Be Kind to Yourself. And maybe it's cheating to give a talk based on Suzuki's talk, but I kind of figure that uh, Zen talks, they've been in Soto Zen at least uh, a thousand years of talks. Um, so all the great talks have already been given. <laughs> it's kind of like um, in rock music, all the great songs were written in the 60s by the Stones, the Beatles, the Who, Maybe Led Zeppelin, maybe the Kinks, and all people are doing now is recycling. So this is, I think you, I think it's, I think it's appropriate that I give a talk uh, based on what Suzuki um, said. So in in this talk, um, this was a talk he gave to Zen students, um, probably in the late '60s in California, just like us, and he said. He wanted us to have the actual feeling of true practice. So this is his talk about true practice. And apparently, Suzuki would frequently say, this is the most important thing. And then everyone would vote. And he had lots of, this is the most important thing. This is the key to true practice. And they're all, they're all true. So um, today he was talking about um, how to have the actual feeling of true practice. And he said, he compared it to his practice when he was a young Zen student. He said he would go to hear Zen talks and he'd feel deeply moved, but he wouldn't really understand why. He didn't understand his experiences. And he said he was practicing stepladder Zen. Um, and what he meant was his approach to Zen practice was well, I understand this much now, and then in a year I'll understand that much, and next year I'll understand that much. And he said, that was a big mistake, um, because you'll never be satisfied. You'll never be satisfied when you practice that way. No matter how much you learn, you still, if you're approaching it that way, you still think that you're missing something. So he said, Stepladder practice is a mistake. Um, it doesn't make sense. Instead, he invited us to do true practice. And he said true practice was being very kind with yourself. And because he was talking about practice, he was talking about Zazen um, primarily, at least initially. So he was saying be very kind with yourself when you do Zazen. Um, and he said, when we do Zazen, we should have a very warm feeling towards ourselves. And he said, when you do things with a warm hearted feeling, that's true practice. That's actual practice. That's authentic practice. Um, and he said, if you just practice Zazen, um, without this feeling of kindness to ourselves, without this warm-hearted feeling, it's um, lifeless. It's lifeless practice. So um, he said true practice 
is doing it with this kind feeling towards yourself. Um, and I think we do a pretty good job of um, teaching Zazen with um, kindness and we tell people do this practice with kindness to yourself. So when you notice that you're um, just daydreaming, uh, very kindly and gently return to just this. But I think we could do, a, I can do a better job of practicing uh, following Suzuki's teaching of being kind to myself when I'm doing Zazen throughout it and trying to develop this warm feeling. And he said that um, the actual purpose of Zazen instruction is to encourage, encourage you to be kind with yourself, which is not something that we hear too often, but that's the actual purpose of Zazen instruction. And he said, um, the way that we can be kind to ourselves and develop this warm feeling towards ourselves is to take care of each moment. So ordinarily, we may practice Sazen um, where we're taught to adopt this upright posture and um, follow our breathing as a way of getting out of our thinking discursive mind. And Suzuki is saying, um, the better way to do it is to follow your breathing, to take care of your breathing. Right? So it's a little bit different emphasis. Um, and we maintain this upright posture to take care of ourselves, to take care of this posture. So he says, we should take care of each moment, right? Whatever moment we're in, we're taking care of the moment. And by taking care of the moment, we're taking care of ourselves, And um, we're doing true Zen practice. And when he talked about taking care of each moment and taking care of ourself when we're doing Zazen, he used the um, metaphor or the example of the way a mother takes care of a newborn baby. So it's not, so it's very intimately connected. It's not in the head, like thinking, what do I do? What do I do? It's just this connection, this bond of you just know instinctually what to do because you're so connected the way a parent is with a newborn. Um, and maybe not a human parent, maybe a, another type of animal parent, but you know, maybe a cat with his kitten, we can use as an image. Um, so it's that type of taking care of, very, very intimate. And this reminded me of um, Dogen, you know, Dogen, the founder of our school. Um, one of his um, most famous works is Instructions to the Cook. And it's really a great read. Because um, he's telling, he is giving good instructions to the Tenzo on how to cook for uh, the monastery, but he's also giving instructions to the Tenzo on how to live his or her life. And he says, when you're when you're the Tenzo, you should have three minds: magnanimous mind, joyful mind, and parental mind or nurturing mind, which in Japanese is roshin. So I think this is what Suzuki is talking about: cultivating this roshin, this parental mind towards ourselves, not just ourselves, but we start with ourselves. And then Suzuki Roshi says that this practice of kindness to, to ourselves is wisdom and it is enlightenment. So it's not just something we do to feel good but it's actually manifesting wisdom and enlightenment. He says, when you do something with a warm hearted feeling, Manjushri is there and the true you is there. So when you do something with a warm hearted feeling, Manjushri is there. And Manjushri is the Bodhisattva of wisdom, uh, the Bodhisattva that um, 
sees emptiness and non-duality. Um, traditionally, Zen centers have a statue of Manjushri on their altar, and we used to have a statue of Manjushri on our altar. Um, but in our effort to um, create a better world and smash the patriarchy, <laughs> we replaced Manjushri um, with a female Bodhisattva. But we know that Bodhisattvas don't have genders, they just appear to have genders. Anyway, <laughs> um, when we practice with this kind-hearted feeling, Manjushri, the spirit of wisdom, of emptiness, is, is here. And the true you is here. Um, and then he also, Suzuki Roshi also says, so we put emphasis on warm heart, warm sazen. This warm feeling we have in our practice is enlightenment. So why is acting or feeling kind to, towards ourselves and our practice um, wisdom? Why is it enlightenment? And I think it's because when we're being kind to ourselves, it's a form of um, non-discrimination because we're not being kind to ourselves. Um, because we're judging ourselves as being worthy of kindness, right? Um, we're not judge. We're not being kind to ourselves because we think we are kind people. So we're doing it without judging ourselves either as being worthy of kindness or as being a kind person. That that's what they do. Um, it's kindness. Um, that is meta from the uh, Brahma Viharas, um, the heavenly abodes. Uh, one of them is metta, which is loving kindness. And the thing about metta is it, it doesn't discriminate. It rains down on everyone, including us. Um, and um, so we don't need to judge ourselves as whether we're um, worthy of kindness and warm feeling, right? Um, because when you're judging yourself, you are um, engaging in delusion. Because whether you think you're worthy or you think you're unworthy, um, it's delusion. If I think, ah, oh, uh, I'm a terrible person, I shouldn't be feeling good to myself, I did all these horrible things, that's delusion. Um, how can I say I'm a bad person? What's the yardstick, right? And how can I be the judge of that? Um, I'm the worst, <laughs> we're the worst judges of ourselves, I think. Um, and if I say, oh, I'm a good person, I'm worthy of uh, feeling kind towards myself, that's also delusion, right? I'm not a good person. Um, so whether you think you're good or bad, just that grasping of that judgment is delusion. So it's best to just not have any judgment about yourself. Um, and we, we do the practice, the true practice that Suzuki says of uh, kindness towards ourself because um, that's our practice. <laughs> um, it's beyond good or bad, beyond um, judging. So Suzuki says, um, you may, he says, we're, we're not being kind because we're warm hearted people. He says, you may think you are warm hearted, but when you try to measure how warm hearted, you can't actually measure, right? Like what's the yardstick? Um, so when we're judging, we're separating ourselves from our true self. Um, if you think you're good, then you're missing aspects of yourself, the things you do that aren't so beneficial. And if you think you're bad, um, then you're missing, you're, you're, you're practicing aversion. You don't want to see the, the bad parts of yourself. And the, the, you're inherently not seeing your true self.
Um, I remember um, Shohaku Okimura, who was our teacher here years ago, would say, there's no such thing as a good driver, right? And this is like basic Nagarjuna. There isn't a thing that's a good driver. There's driving. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Um, there's no such thing as a good person or a bad person. It's beyond measure. Now, that doesn't mean we can be jerks, right? We're, we have to be good people. We have to try our best to um, reduce the suffering that we cause ourselves and others. We're bodhisattvas. So we can't fall too much in the side of emptiness, but we can um, do this practice with uh, a feeling of non-discrimination, of non-judging, of kindness towards ourselves. So, um, according to Suzuki Roshi, we, our true practice, our practice of kindness towards ourselves is an expression of wisdom. And um, so we, we practice kindness to our, ourselves in Zazen um, because it's also part of um, the Eightfold Path. So we do it because the Buddha told us to, not just Suzuki Roshi told us this true practice, but the Buddha said, be kind to yourself. And he, he says it, well, you know, the, the Eightfold Path is part of the Four Noble Truths. And um, the Four Noble Truths are um, the existence of Dukkha, the cause of Dukkha, the cessation of Dukkha, and the way to cease it, which is the Eightfold Path. And the seventh aspect of the path is right effort. And right effort includes, um, it's the effort to let go of unwholesome states of mind and generate wholesome states of mind. Right? That's right effort, it's part of the path. So if we sit and think, um, I'm not doing this right. I don't know what I'm doing. I really suck at this practice. You know, that isn't a right effort. Um, right effort is doing this practice and cultivating a feeling of kindness and warm heartedness towards ourselves, towards our zazen. Um, and, uh, Suzuki says, when you see yourself with a warm feeling, that is actually you. When you see a reflection of yourself in a river, that's actually you in the river. You may say it's just a reflection of yourself, but if you look carefully with a warm hearted feeling, that's actually you. And I think what he's getting at is when you practice this way, you're not separating um, you from the experience of this moment. Um, so you're everything you encounter. You're not separated. Everything you see is you. Everything you experience is you when you practice from a uh, uh, an effort of being kind to yourself. And um, Suzuki says, when you're kind to yourself with each breath in Zazen, um, you'll have a warm feeling in your Zazen. And when you have a warm feeling in your practice, this practice will extend to your everyday life. So I think the way we treat ourselves in Zazen um, extends to how we treat ourselves when we're walking around, which um, is how we treat everyone else when we're walking around. And um, <clears throat> so I thought maybe we'll just like take a moment and try this, see if we can do it. All right. so. Um, Let's just sit up. 
and um, straighten our spine. Yeah, you know, well, do it. Do what you do. You know what to do. And breathe deeply. And let's just take care of each breath. And let's just enjoy our breathing. And let's have a feeling of warm heartedness towards ourselves. All right, so we've just been doing um, true practice. Not according to me, according to Suzuki Roshi. So um, Suzuki ends by saying, um, if you do true practice, you'll have good control over your desires and your everyday life. And then you will have big freedom from everything. This is the goal of our practice. All right, thank you. So, um, floor is open for jokes, <laughs> rebuttal. Um, <laughs> comments. I think it's interesting how when you first start this practice, and you start really looking at yourself and trying to apply that kindness to yourself, it's it's almost shocking. It feels <laughs> rebellious and against your whole feeling that you're not good enough. And once you face that feeling of not good enough, it, it's, it's like everything changes. And that, that kindness, I, I, I truly believe that, that that is the heart of practice because it's, it's very challenging to be that kind to yourself. Thank you for the reminder. Sure, thank you. Yeah, I think we're, um, our minds evolved um, to uh, not be satisfied with ourselves because that helps us survive. Um, but our minds didn't a lot didn't evolve for us to be happy. So Buddhism is a practice of how <laughs> our uh, genetic programming uh, using our minds so we can be happy. And part of it is just being kind to ourselves and uh, letting go of the inner voice that says you're not worthy, you're not good enough, blah blah blah, because. You know, we have to be kind to that voice too. It's a survival voice. You know, it's part of the human condition, but we don't have to uh, give it so much weight. We can just see it as another ephemeral thought going by. I read one time about the Dalai Lama giving a talk in this country, and he said something. Oh, what was it? Something about. Well, anyway, the reaction that he got was people saying, but I don't like myself, I'm a bad person, or whatever. And, 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 this, and he leaned over to his advisor and he's like, what are they talking about? <laughs> and, the, and they had a little back and forth. Uh -huh. And then and his, his advisor or his translator was trying to explain to him about self-hatred, and he didn't get it. Really? <laughs> he never heard of such a thing. Mm -hmm. And... Um, in my memory, he started to cry up there on stage, but I don't, that's probably my memory. 
But it, it helps me a little bit. It, it also disturbs me to think that it's something in our culture that's doing that to us. I mean, apparently, mm -hmm. he had never seen it before. He didn't know anything about it. Um, which helps me a little bit to let go of it, you know, to see that it's not necessarily possible. And the other thing about it is um, that we change in every moment. You alluded to this. If we change in every moment, what is this good, better, best, not good, not okay? Yeah. You know, that the whole thing about labeling. Um, I heard a talk years ago by a teacher named Yvonne Rand who talked about how she um, just made a practice of not going there at all. You know, even with these Cheerios taste bad this morning. Mm -hmm. and, and at the time it just seemed so outrageous. But it's a really interesting thing to try to do. You know? mm -hmm. So maybe get, get more specific. Yeah. This box of Cheerios, I think, is stale, <laughs> but it's not that. <laughs> yes. yes, thank you. Yes. And um, that reminds me of Tim's talk, story about Suzuki Roshi, who had to go watch these Japanese movies with his parishioners all the time, and they were like really cheesy movies. And Tim said, do you like any of them? And he said, I like them all. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah. and there's the opening line from one of our uh, Zen chants of the great way is not difficult, just don't pick and choose. <clears throat> oh, hey, Wayne. So the theme of Suzuki's talk, your talk today, seems to be in a little bit of tension with some of the things that we say, in particular, I'm thinking of the, the meal gato that we say during the session, mm -hmm. uh, one that I use probably inappropriately. My whole dinner table every once in a while because it tweaks my expectations about pleasure, much to the dismay of my lovely wife. <laughs> but, but it goes, um, <clears throat> we, we reflect on our virtue and practice, and whether we are worthy of this offer. Mm -hmm. And I don't bring this up to say anything, but what others in particular say how you feel about the theme of the talk versus saying that got that for discussion. Well, Suzuki would respond with the title of his book. <laughs> <laughs> not, not always so. So, you know, we're comfortable with paradox and we're comfortable with contradictory teachings because nothing can express give the right answer to every moment of their life. Yes, we have to. It's a great it's a great verse to chant. Am I worthy of this offering? Because it takes us out of her head. Wayne, thank you. That was a wonderful talk. And it was so interesting to watch my own mind as you started this talk and you said, Suzuki, like first thought is, you know, practice was about like getting, knowing the next thing and then knowing the next thing. And, and I'm like, yeah, that's just good. Yes, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, and then you turn it around, you're like, that's not what he said was good practice. Or, you know, it wasn't there that. And I'm like, ah. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, I just, I love that about watching my own mind and being curious and then having the ability to laugh, you know, mm -hmm. and just say, oh, well, I learned something every day. So thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, because we do need to learn. We do learn, right? Our, our understanding deepens and, and that's good too. Um, Thank you. Right, thank you. I think what comes to mind is Suzuki Roshi's phrase, the one that is attributed to him is that you're perfect the way you are and you produce it over. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. 
Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he apparently that. came. He said to his Zen students, um, "You're all perfect, just as you are, and you can use a little improvement." <laughs> <laughs> Was that Suzuki? Suzuki. Does anyone know anyone who's actually in the room when he said that? Of ten was in the room. We all were. We all were. <laughs> 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 right. It's like being a wizard. Yes. Um, thank you. I think that in, um, outside of sitting, there's always this tension. I work in manufacturing where everything has a standard. The tension being when we don't meet the standard, it's hard to be able to investigate something open heartedly, not without blame, just like, hey, we didn't hit the standard. We just need to figure out why so we can fix it and get better. And that part is probably the most difficult part of solving a problem in manufacturing because immediately people feel, again, going, we're bad, we're not worthy, we weren't good enough. And we kind of have a saying that uh, be hard on the process, be soft on the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, work is a great opportunity for this practice. Well, I'd like to share a, a word that I learned um, reading from, um, some Pema Chodron. Um, she introduced me to the word Shenpa, which I see is carried in her head. Shenpa translates to, sometimes you can call it attachment, but it also she calls it sticky feeling. And I think that really describes quite well what Raymond is talking about, where we have our habits, our habitual ways of um, reacting to our feelings that come up. And if we attach to it and stay with it, it becomes Shen Pa and it becomes the sticky feeling. Um, and as Pana Shodron talks about it, it's almost exactly um, the feeling of closing of the heart and um, pushing away the, the kind-hearted, um, warm feeling. And I think it's important to be able to recognize both sides of it because um, that is just, that's part of how we live. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting to me how these ancient practices um, align with current scientific understanding of the brain and neural pathways um, like uh, uh, neuroscientists would say that it's important to feel good and um, actually develop these warm hearted feelings and let them sink in because it's wiring our neurons in a certain way. Um, yeah, so this sticky feeling is there's you know, probably an actual uh, biochemical reason for it. Um, and that, that's, that's science, right? Who cares about that? <laughs> science is just telling us what we already know. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Can I add on to that? Sure. Yeah, hi. Um, I've been going slowly through returning to silence. Um, Katagiri Roshi, one of his works, and I hit this point in the middle of the, the text, and he was talking, hi, sorry. He's talking about um, the how essential it will be for, for Zen Buddhism to reclaim a sense of faith, um, because a big part of the founding and sort of the way that Zen Buddhism and Soto Zen became a part of American culture was through philosophy, that it was a, a, the science and the psychology. And he said, that's great, but it won't last if we stay only with that. It, it has to be a part of faith. Um, it has to, and I think faith is a really tricky word for a lot of us who discover Zen from other traditions, from other places where we started. And that word carried a different meaning. 
um, I, in my work, I'm a trauma therapist and I do a lot of work with people who struggle with the verb of kindnessing to themselves. It's like as an idea, it makes sense, but actually practicing it, like you're saying, is a whole nother thing. And for many of us, I think having faith in kindness comes very naturally. And for many others of us, it is just so foreign and completely lost. Um, the idea of practicing kindness feels anathema. It doesn't work. It doesn't, it, we can't connect to it. And I think there's something about this practice and about your talk about almost how kindness is this thing outside of us. It's, it, we both experience it in practice and it encounters us. Um, and I think that that's kind of a, a piece of faith. Like we have to trust that out there somewhere, out there somewhere in our practice, kindness will meet us even if we can't find it initially or in the moment. Um, yeah, it's just really beautiful to have faith in kindness even when we can't muster it up for ourselves that it'll st it's still there. We still may find it it's through many different means. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Yeah, I think this is a religious practice. Um, whether you want to talk about faith or not, it isn't um, just a philosophy or just a therapy. It's a religious practice. And um, that was drilled into us um, by telling us that uh, Zazen is good for nothing. Right? You don't use this to get something. And we do this kindness practice um, because it's a manifestation of uh, the Bodhisattva Manjushri. It's a manifestation of wisdom and enlightenment. And these, these are, I think, at heart religious ideas. Uh. You just brought up the word religion and the talk is on kindness. And Rosemary had brought up uh, the Dalai Lama earlier. Uh, the quote I love from, uh, from the Dalai Lama is when he is asked, what is your religion? And he simply says, my religion is kindness. Just, yes. and to me, that just distills it all down. It's one word. It's all you need. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Now, I've also heard it attributed to him um, he says, be kind whenever possible. It's always possible. <laughs> the little bit of uh, meditation that you had us do where you uh, suggested we take care of our breath, um, it felt different to me. Um, and I wish we, I kind of wish we'd done it longer. And I'm, I'm going to try that some more. Just it felt like a different type of setting to me than, than what I normally do. So thank you for that. Sure. Yeah. yeah, it felt different to me too. Mm -hmm. We should incorporate this into our intro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, I want to say something. Um, this has always been a, kind of a tricky part of practice for me um, because it's always kind of, it's kind of this balance between like the shikintaza just sitting, um, like the, the moon doesn't conquer the earth, and then also applying the, the balance of the pool. There's also some room for some effort as well mentally. So. It's always a, a tricky, a tricky thing as far as um, is, is this kind of like, am I trying to cultivate something so I don't feel something else versus this is like a healthy kindness that we're trying to cultivate. Um, but it's always just a, uh, something to, to play around with. Um, so yeah, that was one thought. And then another one was um, someone once Sent to me. I don't remember what the list of it was, but they said it was Buddhist, but it was like a three poisons of self pride or something. I don't remember what it was, but it was it was helpful. And it was the first one is thinking that you're better than other people. 
It's like I'm always thinking you're worse than other people. <laughs> They're the ones thinking you're the same as other people. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I love that because it, it really points towards everyone's individuality. And um, you know, not that everyone's not better or worse than someone else. It's really everyone is just different. And I think that can really, can really manifest everyone's own Buddha nature. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the one constant in all those is the thinking. Um, the judging and the evaluating. And so the paradox in your sitting of, should I be doing this or doing that? That's all thinking. And you're never going to resolve it with more thinking. Right? So that's why we're taught to practice with our body. I also, I also wanted to add something. Um, you know, I've been, I've been thinking, you know, in this country, we're kind of taught this idea of, you know, personal responsibility, and that, you know, we're always supposed to be prepared to face the consequences of our actions. But, you know, sometimes I feel some of us can internalize that idea to the point where we find it easy to blame ourselves when things things go wrong and then we externalize that by you know taking it out on others and then and then it becomes pretty hard for us to uh find that you know zen and find that ability to be kinder to ourselves does anyone else is there anyone else who would feel this way uh, everyone's nodding. <laughs> yeah, um, we don't really need to um, blame ourselves because we're not responsible for our um, environment. We're not responsible for our uh, hereditary. We're really not responsible for who we are. Um, so um, free will is an illusion and we have to act as if there's free will, but we really didn't choose to be who we are. So we have to just do our best, um, but we don't need to take credit for when we do good things or take blame for when we do bad things because we didn't choose to be who we are and we just do our best. what I think. <laughs> what do I know? Anyone else? Just an add on. I think that a lot of times we think of kindness as a verb, as an action. And me, I, me personally, I miss out on just observing all the kindness that is around me. Everything that everything everybody does, including myself. It's, don't even notice it. Yeah. Probably we're our most kind when we're not noticing it. <laughs> uh, I'm a kind, this is a really kind session. <laughs> Anyone else? All right, um, thank you all for uh, being here. And I will now turn it over to Dylan Jeremy. <laughs>